It is our pleasure to welcome Michael Doer to the studio. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. So Michael is the co-founder and CEO of Weno Group, an investment firm that specializes in investing in luxury assets like wine and whiskey. He's recently been awarded the number one wine investment advisor, according to the prestigious Spears magazine. Weno recently won the best global wine investment firm at the 2022 International Investor Awards, while Michael won Wine Investment CEO of the Year. So there is no one better to join us to speak about investing in this alternative asset class than Michael. And the good news is, Ren, as well, he'll be joining us at FinFest because Weno are a major sponsor. Mm, so yes. we can't wait for that as well. So if you've listened to this episode and you've got follow-up questions, find Michael on the day Absolutely. and ask him all the hard questions. Of course, yeah. But Michael, we love to start these interviews by asking people the story of their first investment. And we want to put a bit of a twist on it for you today. Okay. We're talking wine and whiskey investments. Okay. Can you take us back? Do you remember your first wine or whiskey investment? My first wine or whiskey investment? I do. And actually, it was Australian wine. Oh, great. <laughs> Two hands. Uh, I don't know if you've tried it before, but it's, a, it's an amazing vineyard. Um, it's an amazing wine. Not super expensive. I think it's about fifty pound a bottle, mm. um, but very very limited supply. I think they're producing something around three to five thousand bottles a year. Um, it was over in the UK, so I think they must have only imported uh, maybe a thousand bottles in England. But it's a great price point, right? Fifty pounds bottle is a much larger market than say Pefold's Grange, which is released at a thousand pound a bottle. Mm. You know, the amount of people drinking fifty pound is much much higher than someone drinking a thousand pound a bottle. So um, that was. That was my first case of wine, investment grade wine. Yeah, How's it sure. gone as an investment? Yeah, really good, yeah. really good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I hope I hope so. Yeah. You know? <laughs> if it didn't go well, I probably wouldn't be sitting here sitting with you guys today. Yeah. <laughs> um, but funny enough, my first investment was a pony when I was 14 years old. Oh, That's okay. how I got into this industry. Yeah. Um, when I was 12, I worked in a stables, um, just sweeping floors and you know mucking out horses. And I then I then learned to ride, and um, I bought a pony for 50 pound back when I was 14 and then trained it for the summer and then sold it for I think 350 pound oh, wow. and then I then just start to replicate that model take on a it's a very similar business model to most luxury assets right you take something undervalued and uh, you then manage it in a certain way and then you sell it on at a later date I did exactly that same business model and that's what geared me up and it got me into to wine and whiskey uh, a lot of my collectors or buyers of horses at the time would bring me over to the house and show me this amazing wine collection and whiskey collection and then I just became obsessed with this this concept um, and that's how I got into the whiskey and wine industry at about 20, 21 years old. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's certainly not an asset class that we've spoken a lot about on the show. We're very much focused on equities here. And, yep. um, but as Ren said in the intro, love understanding more about alternative um, investment opportunities. So convince us why wine? What's the investment case? Okay. So the unique point about wine and why I became obsessed with, with these two asset classes because they're, they're consumable. So you look at any other asset class out there, especially luxury assets, uh, fine art, classic cars, there's always going to be, let's say you're buying uh, Aston Martin DB5. Yeah, for me, one of the greatest cars ever made. But there's, say, 100, 200 in the world. There's probably always going to be 100 or 200 left in the world, mm -hmm. right? But with wine and whiskey, I became obsessed with this concept. Well, if I could buy in young and hold that long enough, till it gets to a um, drinkable window, whether that's five, 10 years, whatever it is. As long as I find the consumer, I've got a happy investor who's made good profit, and then I've got someone who's enjoyed a bottle of whiskey or a bottle of wine with friends and family. They've paid a good price, everyone's happy. So I just became obsessed with this kind of natural life cycle that wine and whiskey has that no other asset class has. And that's what I focus the business model on. So that's why I start to build a way now. I start to just be obsessed with this, this concept of this natural life cycle of wine and whiskey. And, and it's, the good thing about wine and whiskey is it's not, I'm not really, a, I'm not a high risk guy. You know, I'm not looking to, you know, double my money overnight. I've never liked, because that also means you're risking all of your money overnight, mm. right? Um, I look for long-term safe growth and wine and whiskey tends to perform, you know, one or 2% every couple of months or so. It's quite a boring investment to watch, but it's a very exciting investment to be involved in mm. because you then learn about the vineyards and distilleries, um, but it's not correlated to other markets. So we saw over the past, especially the last three years, we had uh, Brexit in the United Kingdom, Europe. We then had COVID and now the war of Russia affecting all of the imports and exports of fine wine had no effect on the wine or whiskey market whatsoever. Yeah, wow. you know, so even with Russia not importing, and they imported roughly around a billion, billion pounds worth of wine each year from across the world, stopped overnight. And then a lot of my clients spoke to me and said, should we be worried about this? And um, 
track record would suggest that no, you shouldn't. But of course, there's always a hesitation. Well, okay, well, Russia's not taking in as much fine wine stock now. It could mean there's a surplus amount of stock. It was just mopped up by China, Germany, it, it, everyone else in the world, North America. North America dropped their import taxes on European wine. So the American consumers started buying as much wine as possible from Europe. So it had not a single effect. Same as COVID. Everyone was drinking. It changed the way people were consuming these products, right? I They're, drank more in COVID. Yeah. Everyone did. <laughs> yeah, but people started to drink better as well. You know, they start to say, well, okay, I'm going to, you know, spend, because I'm having a takeaway or whatever, I'm not spending, you know, a lot of money on dinner. Mm. I'm going to, instead of have two bottles of wine at £50 each, I'm now going to buy one bottle of wine at £100. And so actually it introduced a lot more consumers into the fine wine market, into the fine whiskey market, mm. which is great. Yeah, mm. that's yeah. fascinating. Mm. So Michael, you said uh, you got into the wine and whiskey investment business at 20 or 21. And mm. all I could think then was I was buying a lot of wine at 20 or 21, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but it certainly wasn't Green investing. Sack. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sack. Someone told me that the other day. Someone said they have to uh, night me arriving to Australia with a goon sack. Yeah, we've got oh, one in the fridge. I really are. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Do you call it goon sacks in I've never Europe. heard of it before in my life. It's an Australian no. thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they said about something hanging it on a, a pole and swinging it around. Yeah, on a goon of fortune. On yeah, a, goon of uh, fortune. Hills hoist. Hills hoist. Um, right, washing okay, clothesline. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm yet yeah, to do it, yeah. but maybe you know after the podcast we can give it. Back. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately we don't have a uh, clothesline at Finfest. Otherwise, we could have <laughs> okay, done yeah, that. We yeah. just pass it around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you said at 20 or 21, you yep. started investing. And then yep. at some point after that, you started Oweno. So mm. can you sort of tell us the story of you, your time in that industry yeah. when you started Oweno and I guess what you've learned over yeah, the time? Yeah, so I, I came into the industry and, and I, I never thought I would be a CEO or a founder. You know, I was never, you know, I kind of left school quite young, never really had that in me, never thought I could be, you know, in that position. But it was, I got into the industry and I saw how everyone was doing it wrong. You were either a wine merchant selling stock for consumption or selling stock to the trade, or you were this investment company. And I saw every investment company in the market, even the ones that have been running 10, 15 years at the time, that were just geared up for selling the stock and didn't really think about the consumers. And for me, the investment is still tied to the consumers. Although all our collectors and investors are buying for financial profit, you still need to find the consumers. Otherwise, you've just got this stock held by the company. If you can't find the consumer, how are you going to exit the, the market for your clients? And no one, even to this date, there are very few companies, if any at all, which have this business model. So I just said, I, you know, there's a gap in the market here. I don't believe anyone in the industry is doing this the right way. And so I said, even though I was 20, I think 25 at the time or 24 at the time, I was like, you know, I need to build, I need to build this company myself. So we then start to found this company with the business model, with always the idea that we're going to build this for the investors and the collectors, but we need to also have an arm which deals with consumers and deals with the trade. So that's what you see with Awayno at the moment. You see we've got our four core companies, right, the arms. You've got Awayno Trade, which we sell to some of the you know, highest uh, restaurant chains like Hakkasan Group, for example, over there in the UK. Um, we work with some of the biggest uh, restaurants and hotels over there. We then have Awayno House, which is our merchant arm. It's like the window into the company where... The way I saw it is companies nowadays are trying to be as virtu you know, virtual as possible. They're trying to be all online and save costs. But I wanted to be as transparent as possible. And because we're dealing with physical assets, I wanted to have a space where people can come by, see the rare bottles, and, and open them and consume them if they want to. So we've got a beautiful four-story uh, building in, um, in Royal Exchange, which is right in the city, right in the heart of, of London. Um, and we've got a lovely outside terrace. It's busy every night and it's lovely to go there and see, because it's probably split 50% client-owned stock of my investors and 50% uh, of my, my own sort of company stock. So it's nice to go there in the evenings and watch someone open a bottle of Dom Perignon mm. and you know your investor bought that three years ago. They've made you know 50% growth on it and now a consumer's enjoying a, enjoying a nice after, after night kind of you know, glass of champagne and you just see the circle work. It's an electrical cycle, it's lovely to see. Mm. Um, and now we've now opened the Australian fund. You know, that's where we, we uh, work with two great partners, Max Nee, Charles Nee, who are director of the fund. Um, and they were investors in the company. They found us somehow. Um, and uh, I got very close, good friends of mine now. And they said, are you in Australia? And I said, well, we have a lot of Australian clients because there's, there's very few people which the yeah, investors around the world can go to. For example, you guys over here in Australia don't have wine or whiskey investment companies, get up, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
And if you, if you have got them over here, you're pretty much locked into only the Australian market. Whereas because I'm in London, and the reason we base ourselves in London, only have our head offices in London, is because it's a central hub in the world for trading wine and whiskey. We can keep all the stock under bond, so no VAT and tax to pay. Um, and then we can ship out to consumer markets across the, across the globe, no problem. Whereas if you're in Australia, you've got to pay the import taxes, you've got to pay all the duty. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, then it's tough to then sell to China or sell to North America or the rest of Europe because you've got all these costs involved. Whereas in London, costs are low, um, we've got kind of the entire markets there and we can easily sell, uh, sell from there. So the guys came to me and said, well, let's, let's, let's go for the Australian market and let's attack it with a, with a fund. Um, and that way uh, we can control the stock ourselves, we can manage the stock fully ourselves, we can take the headache, we control all the storage, all the insurance, all the worry that goes behind something like wine. Um, because there's so many questions of, well, where's it stored and what happens if a bottle breaks and how do I know the stock's there? You know, all these obvious, obvious and, and, and good questions that investors have. So we take care of everything. We make sure it's stored in third-party storage warehouses, so not even we can touch it. Um, we make sure it's fully insured at market price at all times because sometimes a bottle will break. Mm-hmm. It, it's just natural. So we make sure it's fully insured at market price at all times. Um, and we make sure that the, the wine and whiskey is stored in the perfect temperature, lighting, humidity, everything. Because that, then on the exit, all these restaurants and consumers will ask, okay, you've got this 10-year-old Penfolds Grange, where's it been kept for the past 10 years? How do I know it's of good quality? If we can say it's gone straight from the vineyards at Penfolds over in Australia, straight to us in storage warehouse, and it's been kept perfectly ever since, they go, perfect. You know, I know it's gonna be good stock, I know I'm happy to pay market price and above. Interesting. So what, uh, how would you describe the investment philosophy at Weno? And we'll, we'll get into a bit later, I guess, what makes a good <coughs> investment when it comes to wine and some of the factors that you look for. Mm. But what's like the guiding philosophy behind it? We, we tend to, for us, it's about, yes, showing profits, but making sure clients' money's safe. Okay, so again, as I said before, yes, it's important for us to show returns to our clients. And on average, we've showed between 11 and 15, spot 8, 7% growth each year. But it's also about where are, where are my clients' money safe? Mm. You know, so we tend to diversify portfolios across different regions. Most other wine or whiskey companies look at one region. They go, okay, we're only going to invest in Macallan. We're only going to invest in Bordeaux. And for me, that's crazy because any other investment philosophy is usually diversified, right? It's usually the number one rule mm. for safely investing. So we diversify our clients' funds across wines from California, Napa Valley. We diversify South Australia. We have wines from Rioja, Burgundy, Champagne, Bordeaux. With whiskey, we look at, yes, Scotch, but we also look at bourbon. We look at Irish whiskey, new make Japanese whiskey. Um, and that way then, even if Bordeaux has a bad year or, you know, uh, Irish has a bad year, Irish whiskey, you know you've still got access to the other markets. You know that the portfolio is not going to take a, a big hit. Mm. And that so far has worked very well for us to, to kind of play it safely. So on, on that point around diversification, whiskey and wine, are mm. there other alcohols that hold their value? Like I assume... Tequila. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was appro- I've, I've been approached several times about buying tequila casks. Yeah. And yes, it's a good investment, but it's a very niche market yeah, okay. and it's not quite big enough for me to take it seriously and go okay you know we can buy enough tequila cast for my clients and then you know bottle it and sell it out and it's still not i think in the next five ten years it'll be interesting but mm. especially over in, in 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 london or in europe people aren't drinking tequila properly yet yeah people still see it as a shot yeah i was gonna you know, ask you, you, just you drink, yeah, exactly properly? well like a scotch you yeah, should have it in a nice yeah, glass yeah, and yeah, you should yeah. sip it you know, yeah, you shouldn't yeah. be, you shouldn't really shot it. Yeah. But everyone likes to shot. And if you have a good tequila, you can sip it. If you have a cheap one, then you probably yeah. just want to shot it. But what, what about like a gin? Because I don't know if it's the same in the mm. UK, but the last five years in Australia, gin has it's had gone a real roof, moment. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, has, yeah. yeah. But it's just, it's, it, you know, you can make gin so easy. It oh, doesn't yeah. really need much aging. Um, supply and demand, you know, these, the, these, these gin, gin factories, they, they can produce like, 10 million bottles yeah right okay so supply and demand yeah, doesn't yeah. quite work you've got to remember that the reason wine and whiskey goes up in value is supply and demand mm. if you've got a, a vineyard that can only produce say, a burgundy can only produce say a thousand bottles that's a thousand bottles that can only go to a global market and then as those bottles are consumed it's rarer to find it price goes up and of yeah. course as the wine you've got to remember the wine's still maturing in the bottles whereas something like whiskey or gin or tequila it doesn't age mm. when it's bottled it only ages in the cask mm. so the liquid's not changing Whereas wine, it will mature. You know, Bordeaux, for example, a top Bordeaux needs 15, 20 years aging, mm. you know. Um, and even Penfolds Grange, although you guys drink Penfolds Grange 
relatively young in Europe, we like our wine to be aged, right? So we need that 10, 15, 20 years of, of, of maturation to start consuming it. Mm. Maybe a dumb question, but why has beer never had the same sort of approach? It goes off, doesn't it? Well, I don't know, does it? <coughs> well, okay, like it's, it's, not market, it's not rare. It's not rare. But you know, it could be like a, a, a vineyard here could a vineyard a, a wheat guy could yeah. produce a wheat guy he could do he could do he could do a thousand cans and you know, just say there's a gap in the market maybe it is but no the <laughs> beer, beer beer wouldn't you know beer doesn't have that number one it's not really seen as a prestigious drink is it mm. single you know everyone just has a pint of beer yeah um, or a, what I learned I learned you guys have a is it Schmidty or a Skiddy or a uh, schooner. Schooner. schooner? Schooner, yeah. Then yeah, someone at, the, yeah. someone at the pub yesterday asked me if I wanted a schooner. I had no idea what he meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't change once it's bottled or, mm. you know, and that supply and demand. You know, the reason you have a vintage of wine, because every vintage is different, yeah. right? It's affected by how much light is hit, mm. you know, how much water, how much rain, you know, it, each vintage, you, you, I could give you a, and we'll probably have some bottles to taste at the, um, at the, at the seminars, at the exchange, but the, the vintage of say 2015, 2016, you'll taste a difference. Mm. And then you go back to 2005 and you taste a difference. Mm. You know, whereas beer, yeah, if you have a Peroni here, a Peroni back in London, yeah. I think it's going to be the same. Yeah, and true. probably 10 years' time, it still tastes the same. Yeah. yeah. So there's yeah. not really that. Fair they cool. just keep... No uh, gap in the market. No, no yeah. gap in the market. <laughs> we'll yeah. give it a try. I'm willing to give it a try, you guys. But. <laughs> so I, I'm fascinated by this idea of a depreciating supply because I, I, I never really thought of that. When, when you're talking about the top-end wines, you know, the... I was about to start listing examples and I realized I didn't yeah. really know any examples, but yeah. you know, your Penfolds Grangers sure. or, or whatever it is, or sure. even more premium than that. Yeah. Are people at, like, what percentage of them are actually being drunk? Like mm. I would assume uh, my assumption coming into this is that they just sit in storage. No, yeah. no, no, never. No, they're being consumed. The whole okay. market is based off consumers. Yeah. Um, and okay. You say 5,000 pounds is an expensive bottle of wine to consume, but how many multi-millionaires, billionaires are there on the planet yeah. that are happy to consume this every day? Mm. Yeah, a friend of mine was in the Maldives. Charles was telling me a story. I think it was Charles or, or Max telling me a story. They were in the Maldives uh, a couple of years back and a guy came to the restaurant and this is a random atoll in the Maldives and just bought six DRCs. DRC Romney Conti is one of the rarest wines on the planet. It's probably about 26,000 pounds a bottle. Um, <laughs> and he just had six at dinner. Wow. You know, so these guys and girls that do make serious money... Um, yeah, there's a huge market for it. They 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 consume it, and not you, you haven't got to be a billionaire or, or worth you know 200 million. If if, worth, if you've got a big income, you've got the house, you've got the car, you've got everything else. What do you want to spend your money on? You sit down at dinner, you have a good glass of wine, and then naturally you have a better glass of wine, and then you have a better bottle of wine, and then you you know, and it always builds up and builds yeah. up. So you know, it's Screaming Eagle is a very famous vineyard from Napa Valley. They produce something like. Uh, 3,000 bottles a year and you have to be on a waiting list to get it really? and the waiting list is like 100,000 people long so they're just okay we've got the 1,000 bottles it's gone wow. and they just let you know which ones to take and if you don't take it you're off the list wow. so people will just queue up to get this and it's you know three and a half thousand pounds a bottle secondary market seven thousand that's what we need we need a brewery with a waiting list <laughs> yes <laughs> true true that's the secret but as an investment advisor if you're looking at it from an investment point of view if yep. someone walks in and says i want those six bottles of wines or they're at the, at the weno building in london mm -hmm. i want the six to consume there's obviously an investor on the other end of that transaction when do you draw the line between hang on hang on those six bottles could be worth another twenty six thousand pounds in five years versus no. This guy wants to consume it. Let's yeah, it's, it's actually down to the investor. So um, although we manage the stock for all of our investors, um, it's down to them. They may, because some people don't want to hold, hold their money for 20 years. They might just say, listen, I'm happy to hold for three or four years. And if a consumer comes along, uh, you know, and offers me a good price, they're happy to sell out and buy another vintage. Um, if you hold wine too long, you, you will get... So when a wine's released, Bordeaux, for example, all the experts will taste this wine on release. The 20, let's say 2020 vintage, they're tasting it. They'll say, I believe this wine is going to be in its consumable peak uh, 2035 to 2045, a 10-year window. So you want to try and aim, okay, I know if I can sell it over that, that window, I'll probably get you know, the top price for it. As it goes past that window, it doesn't just suddenly go off, mm -hmm. but it starts to come down a bit and probably for the next 10 15 20 years it's still drinkable but it's coming down the price will come down it's getting too old now and then it will get so old that it's undrinkable okay. you know but there are some you know there's some legendary even vintages in in in, in grange like 1950s or 1940s that are still drinkable now 
Wow. You know, so they can have an incredible lifespan. Um, but again, it, it, I'll say to my investors, the longer you can hold the stock, the better it is. Mm. But um, if an investor, if a consumer comes to you and, and, and purchases stock of you and you've made you know, 40% on it in, in three, three years, take it. Mm. You know, we're just buy another, buy another asset. We're just moving to the next vintage. I, I'm just thinking if I was an investor and I had like a $100,000 bottle of wine or whatever mm. it was, I would be so tempted <clears> not to sell it because I'd want to, I wouldn't want someone else to drink it. You know, yeah. I've held it for 20 years. Yeah, I yeah, want to drink yeah, that. Yeah, I don't want yeah, you drinking yeah, yeah. that. But I always say to all of my investors when they come on board, you know, you're buying this stock to make financial profit, right? Mm. Treat it like any other investment. Now, if you want to start collecting wine to consume, that's a different conversation we have. That's a different arm of the company. Yeah. But treat this like any other investment. Mm. Because the old way of, of wine investment, which I hated, was, well, you buy three. You know, first of all, only buy what you like. Because then, hey, if you don't make any money, you can drink it. And I just go, what a terrible yeah, ethos yeah, yeah. for any investment. Mm. You know, you, there's no other investment in the world you go into and go, well, uh, hopefully I'll make money, but maybe not. But at least I can live in the flat. Or at least, you know, I can hang my share certificate on the wall. <laughs> you know, no one approaches that. You treat this like an investment. Okay, I'm, I'm investing 100000 I expect to get 200,000 out in the next 10 years. Mm. Simple as that, okay? Doesn't matter what wine it is, where the experts were selected for you, um, treat it like any other investment. You're there to make money. Yeah. Mm. So Alec and I were standing in a bottle shop wondering what makes a good investment. Okay. What are some of the characters? <laughs> probably the first thing is it's not in the bottle shop. <laughs> ah, you never know. You never know. That's probably you where you find it. <laughs> what are some of the key factors that you look for in a bottle of wine when you're, when you're speaking to clients? Okay, so... Um, we're, we've got an amazing wine team, which curate most of the portfolios and select the wines. But we have to look for, first of all, brand recognition. You know, are they known? Are they known all over the planet? Penfolds Grange, again, you'll find one here. You're going to find that in Brisbane. You're going to find it in Singapore. You're going to find it in Sao Paulo. You're going to find it in London. You're going to find it in every major city in the world, right? And the reason for that is, let's say, for example, um, Penfolds Grange is only consumed. It's only known in Australia. If you guys go into recession and suddenly there's less people consuming that wine, suddenly then the investment's gonna, gonna drop. But if you guys go into recession now, Penfold Grange will keep going up in value because mm -hmm. China's drinking it, uh, North America's drinking it, you know, South America's drinking it, Europe's drinking it, so there's still consumers across the planet. So first of all, we look at that for a safety point of view. Again, Russia's a prime example, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not consuming it, but it doesn't make a difference. The markets around the world are. So it must have a global recognition, global brand, right? Uh, must have limited supply. So, even Grange, they, they produce a lot of bottles, but um, it must have a limited supply. It must, we must know that they can't produce you know, millions and millions of bottles each year because then you're waiting a very long time for that stock to be consumed. And by next year, there's another million bottles out there mm -hmm. and the year after that. So we make sure that there's a, there's a small supply and a very strong demand. And, and then third point is just the basics, a track record. We need to look back at the past 50 years of vintages and gone, how have they performed in the market? Have they been going up in value each and every single year? If they've not, why has that happened? Um, so those three factors usually keep us keep us safe. It feels like it would be really hard for new uh, winemakers to break in on that. Like the, the three criteria there, you know, around brand mm. and then also around having a track <coughs> record. It's yeah. like... If Bryce and I tried to start a vineyard tomorrow, it's yeah, like, yeah. how do you how do no, you yeah. do that? Take, no, you wouldn't. You need, um, you need Halliday to give yeah. us a, a hundred. Yeah, is, that, is it Halliday? The he's, I think he's he's an Australian or he's he's just like this revered um, wine, wine sort of connoisseur guy who always just brings out a book and rates wines and if yeah. you wine yeah. is like a 96 out of 100 oh, yeah, then yeah, you just yeah. automatically so it's like a, the, a Michelin guide for yeah wines. they give points they have 100 points and say well, it's a great wine or not and that, we don't tend to look at scores that much okay um, it's a good it's a good idea but we don't tend to look because sometimes um, you know the, the critics will score 100 points say it's the they say this is a perfect wine it's a great wine mm. prices will shoot up and our clients can make money but um, you know a lot of these wines need aging and maybe not many people consuming those wines for a long time, whereas the, the vintages that maybe score 92, 93 points, still bloody good wines from great vineyards, um, but they're cheaper. Mm. So actually the market for consuming is much bigger. They're ready to consume faster. So you see the price increase faster than you would on the 100 points growing wines. Okay. Both wines are great investments, but some perform over a short term, some over a long term. Yeah, right. Mm. A whole yeah. bunch of different assets. Yeah. 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 What, one thing, you know, Bryce said, you're standing in the bottle shop and I made the joke that you're probably not finding that investment in the bottle shop. But, uh, you know, you, you said at the start, uh, your first wine investment was a 50 pound yeah. bottle. Yeah. So I guess like you probably could pick uh, some investments up in a bottle Dom Perignon. Shop. Well, 
Dom, Dom Perignon, Perignon is investment. an investment grade wine. Have you guys well, had? Have you guys drunk Dom Perignon before? Yeah. You have? Most people, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people have, yeah. have, have, have had at least one glass I, of Dom Perignon some yeah. time in their life, celebration, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, no, nobody realizes it goes up in price. So yeah, yeah. Uh, usually when the stock's released in the market, and uh, I go through this on a couple of my presentations because so many people know the brand and they think, oh, well, who's going to drink this wine? It's like, you have drunk. Yeah, fine wine yeah, before yeah. you have drunk investment grade wine for you just don't realize but they released the stock on the market i think 2008 which was released uh, about three years ago was released in the market around 1200 pound for a case okay. all right if you think about it with don perignon they released all the stock it's, it's already matured yeah so they, they released the 08 back three 2018 2019 mm. right already ready to mature ready to consume it's purchased by all the restaurants all consumers all merchants by myself all my investors and champagne's there to be uncorked and consumed yes. and then over the next two or three years there's no 08 in the market okay it's a great vintage i then released my client stock back into the market yeah, or the trade yeah. and the price went up about 136 percent in three years no way yeah and sold all the clients Jeez, out and then, and then the you and then you sell to the trade you sell to other merchants who maybe only had 10 cases and they sold it out and they go well, actually a lot of my clients would love 08 dom perion yeah we'll buy it off for you and you think you can't get it in a uh, in a bottle shop? Well, <laughs> you can. I remember, yeah, I remember three or four years ago, Dan Murphy's in Double Bay, mm. and the, this mm-hmm. year I've just looked it up as yeah. well. Dan Murphy's down in Melbourne. Both sold a set of Penfolds Grange for four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, record, to yeah. a retailer. Mm. Yeah. Just just your average guy walking in getting a four hundred thousand dollar yeah. wine collection. Yeah, average guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thirsty, had a barbecue and said, yeah, oh, yeah, well, yeah. well, I think the, the, the four hundred thousand in Melbourne is a wine collector, but the three hundred thousand at Double Bay a few years ago when we were, I was still working at Woolies, they said it was for their Christmas. Mm. Really? Just a, just, just a punter just, just walk consume. in? Just yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Have you yeah. that on card or do you cut a check? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apple Pay, I think you just... Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, Michael, we were looking through your presentation mm-hmm. uh, for FinFest and a number caught my eye. Uh, th- there's a $3 billion market for fraudulent wines. Yes, yeah. Uh, which... In some, it surprised me, but it probably shouldn't have. You know, like mm. any investment industry where there's this much money, there's going to be fraud. Yeah. And I guess that's where you and your team play a key role, um, mm. making sure the wine is, you know, true to label. Can you tell us about this, I guess, this market and yeah, sure. the fraud? And, you know, Bryce and I standing in the bottle shop, how do we avoid getting buying those frauds? Well, it's tough for you guys in the bottle shop because you don't stand a chance. <laughs> you, know, you, you hope that the bottle shop have done their due diligence and know who they're buying from. So we, we try as much as possible to go direct to source. We go to the vineyard. Then we know the stocks come from the vineyard straight to us in storage. You're okay, right? But some stocks so rare, you have to buy in the secondary market. So um, we, we have to make sure that we, we set up a part of the company. We're actually the only... Um, wine merchant wine investment company on the planet which has an anti-fraud department in-house oh wow and so each bottle that comes in on the secondary market goes for a 68 point check and we check through cork capsule we go through the label there's there's special techniques i don't know if you've one of them special techniques to take a look at the label and make sure that it is the correct label it's not just a printed random label so the vineyards will put something secret hidden inside each label of a special light or whatever to check so it goes through this whole this whole list of things to check that the stock's correct um and then it gets a sticker from us like the secret hologram sticker say it's approved and it's verified by us and then we we make sure that we cover that so even if we got it wrong we let one slip through the net we say to our clients even if you found out in 10 years this was a fake bottle we'll cover at market price because clients look to us you know they're not the experts they come to us we're the experts so we have to stand up for what we believe in and put our money where our mouth is and go, okay, this is what we do. So I'm going to guarantee it for you. So we guarantee all of our stock that we sell to clients mm. the whole time. Wow. Yeah. So outside of uh, an in-house fraud team, if mm. I, um, you know, if it's as easy as going to Dan Murphy's to get a, a set of Grange, what do you offer to, to clients otherwise? Yeah, I think the reason that, that my company exists is because this market you can't do by yourself. It used to be that um, you know, very wealthy individuals would have a collection at home. And then they would they would go to sell it and they'd make money off of it and they go wow you know these wines have gone up in value but as an individual where are you going to sell the stock okay auctions is your only chance right mm. auctions charge a big premium and most people now go to auctions to get a discount on on wine and whiskey not to pay market price and above right. you know the auctions where you go to christie's or sotheby's for example it's where you go to buy stock under market price so um also, also it comes down to the storage you know it comes down to provenance if um, you've held, you've got a portfolio at home, you've held the stock. You can't just go to a restaurant and say, listen, I've got this great, it could be the rarest collection in the world. You, you can't just go to a restaurant and say, would you buy this stock from me? 
They don't know who you are. How have you kept the stock? Have you kept it next to the window, next to a radiator? You know, there's all these questions to, to, to ask. Um, and I relate it back to if you're collecting art, okay, if you, let's say you collect Andy Warhols, you can go on eBay and find an Andy Warhol for sale at half the price. Would you risk buying that Andy Warhol for your collection? Absolutely not. Mm. Chances are, God knows where it's been, is it even real? Um, so for us, it's about making sure our clients are fully safe and offering them the trade arm to exit out of the market so they can go straight to the, the, the restaurants and the hotels and sell the stock. And then having the consumer arm as well, the merchant shops, so they can go direct to consumers because that's where you're going to see the biggest biggest price chunk is direct to consumers, right? That's when you pay the highest, highest price. Mm-hmm. If you go to, let's say Dan Murphy's took your stock on, they're not going to pay you market price for it because then how are they going to make their money? They're going to offer you 40% below market mm-hmm. so they can make their margin, right? They have overheads. So it, it is a market where you need to go through, um, you know, a merchant company like ours because it's just, there are, it's a minefield. There are ways it can go wrong. Um, plus, how do you know how long to store it? When do I sell it out? How do I get offers for it? There's all these things, part of it, you know, that, 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 um, you know, that an individ- individual can't do on their own. And that's where people have gone wrong in the past. They've tried to do it by themselves and it's just not one of those markets to, to do on your own. Mm. I guess the the other question uh, that comes to mind, so in the investing world, there's often, uh, you know, talk about gold and do you invest in gold, the asset or the miners behind gold? Mm. When it comes to like wine or whiskey, how do you think about investing in the wine or the whiskey compared to the vineyards or the distillers? Yeah, most vineyards don't actually make a huge profit if you think about it, you know, because if you look at land in, let's say Napa Valley, um, you're buying a vineyard for like 50 million, mm. you know, 100 million, right? Um, and then the overhead costs of having the superstar winemaker there, then all the bottles, and you're only producing you know, 5,000 bottles or so, whatever it is. Um, it's not, it, it's it's really not a business that you make a ton of money in themselves. You tend to find now that most vineyards are owned by super wealthy individuals and it's a passion hobby, like owning a football football club or something like that, right? You know? Um, a nice hobby to have. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a hobby that one day we will have. Yeah. Um, but but you make more money and it's more interesting to just buy into the stock and a lot safer, you know? Mm. Yeah, okay. So, Michael, we are fascinated by the idea of what matters and what doesn't matter in particular industries. You know, in retail, we talk about same-store sales, sales per square foot. When it comes to putting our investor hat on and thinking about investing in wine and are there sort of metrics that we should be focusing on or, or sort of factors that we should be mm. thinking about or conversely, what doesn't matter when it comes to what is said about the wine industry? Yeah, the, the, the good thing about the wine and whiskey industry is that it's not correlated to other markets. So, you know, again, over uh, Brexit when um, the pound plummeted and the FTSE market dropped, whatever, nothing happened to what well, I think wine actually went up 2% that month. You know, because it's a global market. So most people are worried about their their industry and their country that, hey, you know, the property market's dropped or the stock market's dropped. Well, it doesn't make a difference because everyone over in North America is doing great and they're buying a ton of stock. And so I wouldn't be too worried about other um, other markets out there. And most people use this investment as a hedge against high risk parts of the portfolio. They have, you know, one to 5% of their portfolio in wine and whiskey, and it's a safe asset that's not correlated to other markets. Um, but interestingly enough, um, global warming is having an effect. No. You know, because you've got to think about the yields that some of these vineyards can make. We know for a fact that Burgundy, for example, um, their yields are down about 80% uh, to about 80% of what they could be. Wow. Um, so you know that, okay, this vineyard produces 4,000 bottles a year and already supply and demand's working in our favor. But I know over the next three years, they're probably gonna be releasing 3,000 bottles. That's gonna be work even more in our favor, but it also means I'm gonna buy up a lot of the older stock because consumers of that particular brand can't get enough of the new stock, so they're gonna start buying some of the older stock. Mm-hmm. So it helps you then buy older stock and as much of the new stock as possible. Mm. And in the other fires in Australia, there's yeah. not much, you know, I think twenty, I think 2021 is supposed to be an amazing, amazing year for Australia. So we know that their stock's gonna be great. Um, but the fires had a bit of effect, big effect. Napa Valley, the fires had a huge effect over there. Mm. Um, and again, you've got now less of the, uh, of the actual asset coming into the market and the demand is just soaring, soaring, soaring. So again, the prices are just, you know, last year alone we saw 
champagne increase about 40 percent in one year alone wow um i think because everyone came out of covid and celebrated and drank <laughs> yeah, champagne. yeah yeah <laughs> but burgundy as well burgundy went up about 26 percent last year alone just as a whole i mean it's, yeah. you know it's, it's crazy speaking of champagne one thing that you told us before we started recording that i think is worth uh sharing with the audience mm-hmm. was around how actually the wine regions shift as the earth moves as yes well. yeah yeah exactly so coming to that part so over in england it's 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 a, we have to call it sparkling wine English sparkling yeah. wine, can't call it champagne, but that's a huge business now. And um, the soil that was once under France and under Champagne, obviously as the Earth's crust moves, it's now being pushed underneath the ch- channel and coming underneath southern part of England. So the concept is, well, actually, we can grow the same vines there in the same soil that Champagne had. We can produce just as good stock as, as Champagne has. So, you know, the, the world is moving in the dynamics. I mean, that won't have effect for another 50, 100 years, right, 200 years. Mm. But it's interesting to say, OK, well, some of these vineyards have a thousand year plan. Harlan really? Estate, very famous in that valley, has a thousand year plan. Wow. You know, yeah, and they that's have to. Long-term. Absolutely, that's very long term, yeah. <laughs> I remember listening to a podcast maybe five years ago and they were talking about Australian winemakers and how they were sort of on the forefront of climate modelling because mm. they were trying to figure out like where the next good wine regions in yeah. Australia will be mm. with the climate change, and, you know, mm. with this forecast where it will yeah. be good to grow, with this forecast yeah. where it will be good to grow. It would. Uh, it, all it made me think was it would be tough being a winemaker, like yeah. so little margin of it. Yeah, and you're thinking now, well, was this the last good year? You know, was if if my average year was this, and now I'm not getting as much sunlight or rain, or I'm getting an earlier frost, the grapes aren't ripening well enough. You know, is my now best year, my average year, one of my low years that used to be back in the 90s and 80s? Mm. So um, that's interesting to think about as well. And and a lot, actually, most of the vineyards, the guys that have groups of vineyards are looking overseas. They're looking in Chile. They're looking even in India as an interesting place maybe in the next kind of 50 years for for vineyards. Everyone's now just not being focused on France is the only place that does good wine. We've expanded so much. Mm. You know, Australia makes some of the best wines in the world. Spain makes some of the best wines in the world. You know, North America, all these, all countries can make incredible wine. Mm. And we're not so pig-headed as consumers anymore to just focus on one region, mm. which is great. Yeah. Well, Michael, it's been a, a really enjoyable conversation. We do have a few questions to get through to close it out, but um, you are joining us and are a major sponsor of FinFest this Saturday, the 15th, down at Barangaroo. We're super keen. The weather gods are playing in our favor. It looks like it's going to be a beautiful day. Yeah. And finally, you'll see some sun in Sydney. Thank goodness, yeah. <laughs> it is, it is uh, undercover, though, so don't stress if it's not. Um, Michael will actually be doing two prezos, one on wine and one on whiskey. Um, and they also have the Weno Trading Floor Dome, which will have uh, some tastings for some of the beautiful wines yep. that you've been talking about as well. So plenty happening. If you don't have a ticket, make sure you grab one. Um, there are a handful left this Saturday, 15th of October. I cannot wait. It's going to be an awesome day. Mm-hmm. So um, let's close it out, Ren. Yeah, now uh, we like to finish with the same final three questions. We've put a Weno twist on all of them to make them okay. wine and whiskey focused. But before we do... I want to ask one extra one. Sure. Do you have a white whale when it comes to wine or whiskey? A bottle of something that you just haven't been able to get your hands on that you dream of being able to get for yourself or for your investors? I recently acquired... I'll tell you the one I have got and the one I couldn't get. (laughs) I recently acquired um, the world's first space-aged wine. Okay. They sent a case of wine up to space to be aged for 430 days. They only released one bottle. Wow. So we bought it for a million dollars. Wow. Um, it's a serious, uh, it's a serious asset. Yeah, and it comes, it's, it comes with a meteorite corkscrew and so on and so forth. But the one I couldn't get mm. was one of the bottles of champagne that was in the Titanic. Oh, oh wow! They've still, they've got, still one. got one. Yeah, there's a, there's a handful that got sold off to collectors, and every now and again, one bottle comes emerges, and then we have to check: is it really that that bottle? I was yeah. offered the other day um, a collection of Armagnac from supposedly went into battle with Napoleon. No way. <laughs> but it's virtually impossible to guarantee Proof. that it yeah, actually happened, yeah, right? Yeah. So it looks like it did, but I couldn't guarantee it. So it would never be something we would take on and sell to another investor. It would be something that we would maybe buy for ourselves for clients to enjoy and see. Yeah. Because yeah, we could never yeah. guarantee the stock. Mm. Um, oh. But yeah, champagne on Titanic, we've been trying to get, and it's just something, it's the white whale that I haven't quite managed yeah. to get. Yeah. All yeah. I'm thinking now is... Would you drink it? <laughs> well, yeah. no, it's, no, it's a museum piece, right? Yeah. Same as your space wine. It's a museum yeah. piece. It'll never be consumed. Yeah. Um, and it's something... We're trying to build the world's greatest, rarest you know, wine and whiskey collection. Mm. And that's, what that's what the end goal is, really. Um, and so that is that would be perfect addition. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. All I'm thinking is, one, on the Titanic, who was like, we should take a case of 
champagne. Like, well, as you're there was a ton to of champagne off. on Titanic. It was all the wealthy. But who's, the who's, who's, who's rushing sinking. off the boat? No, no, it wasn't. It, it, it sunk. Oh, they dove. It, it sunk with the Titanic. And I think it, it was a Murray. It sunk with the Titanic. No way. And then when they dived Very down and were checking it out, they found oh, a wow. case. Or there's a couple of cases of bottles that, that, that still froze and kind of stayed intact. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. we'll keep chasing that white if you see it, If you see it, let me know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, with that, we'll move on to the three questions that we uh, like to end the interview with. Sure. And the first one is about books. And so um, for people who have had their interest piqued by, you know, this wine and whiskey conversation, are there any must-read books or maybe other resources uh, that can help them learn more about this asset class? Sadly enough, books um the last book written on this was probably done about 10 years ago it's and it's very dated it focuses on bordeaux so i'm actually i'm actually in the process of writing my own book okay to take the market so but, the answer is watch this space well yeah, <laughs> yeah and that should be ready summer next year um but we the Aweno has a, a has a wonderful quite a big guide on um on investing in, in wine and whiskey and that should answer all the questions anyone that doesn't want to actually directly speak to us uh, go online and, and download one of the guides. There should be something on the website to download our guide. That should answer all major questions that um, investors investors Great. have. Yeah, yeah, nice. Perfect. Uh, next question, and maybe I jump the gun with the white whale question, but uh, what's the best bottle of wine you've ever come across? That I've ever consumed? Yeah. Um, the best bottle of wine I've consumed? We did a so we've also got a great reputation in the market for for doing crazy wine tastings. We don't want to be another boring company that just does the same wine tasting every you know go in London for example or in any major city in Europe. There's a there's probably 15 wine tastings a day yeah. somewhere, right? Um, so we just tend to do crazy wine tastings with the the rarest wines in the world. And we were in Venice over the film festival a few years back, and we did something for all of our Italian. We're one of the biggest companies in Italy now for what we do. Um, and so we wanted to put the best of Italy against the best of the, the rest of the world. And there was a Chateau Margot 1990, um, which is Chateau Margot's first growth. It's one of those famous vineyards over in, in Bordeaux. And 1990 is a legendary vintage, and it was just singing. It was incredible. Wow, wow. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. How much would that go for on the market? Uh, I think now you're looking at um, two to three thousand pounds a bottle, something wow. like that. So it's not crazy, crazy mm. expensive. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it would have been released at probably 50 pound, 100 pound a bottle. You know, yeah, back, okay. back in the, you know, 95, 96. Like wow. so. 3,000 pounds is still a fair chunk for a it's bottle of wine. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's still yeah. more expensive yeah. than anything absolutely. I have yeah. ever drunk and yeah. maybe will ever drink. Yeah. Easily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, Michael, uh, final question. If you think back to your younger self, maybe uh, buying the pony at 14 or, mm -hmm. you know, buying those uh, early bottles of wine, uh, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, to not try and fix everything in one day. I used to be incredibly obsessed with, you know, especially when we first started the company, I'd, I'd just be like, we've got so much to do. And I used to just I'd say every day, I'm going to do as much as I can. And they, they tend to find that you did everything half-heartedly, or you only put 50% into it, right? Because you were trying to get a million things done. Now I take the view of, as long as I can change one thing a day and do it perfectly, you then look back in a year, two years, and you go, wow, what a, what a difference I've made. Mm. Yeah, so to not stress yourself out so much and uh, try and do everything at once. Good advice. Like yeah, I love that. So, Michael, absolute pleasure chatting today. We um, learned so much about an industry that we haven't spoken a lot about on the show. My mouth is salivating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to the pub. To the pub. <laughs> not beer, though. Not beer, only wine. <laughs> we do really appreciate your time. Um, good luck with the launch of the fund. Thank you very much. And uh, if anyone's listening and will be at FinFest this weekend, Michael and the team will be yeah. available to answer all the questions you have, taste some of the beautiful wines listen to some of the prezos. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Michael. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.